The gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. So we are here today on Titans of Nuclear with Ben Levitt, who's the Director of Research and Development at Zap Energy. Ben, welcome to Titans of Nuclear. Hey, how you doing? Glad to be here. Yeah, no, super excited to talk to a fusion guy. You know, every now and then we get, you know, we focus mostly on fission, but sometimes we get to touch other things like medical reactors and occasionally fusion. And it's always you know, super interesting to, um, to explore you know, some of the difference, some of the differences and some of the similarities that the sectors have to face. Um, so yeah, yeah guys, let's, let's get into it. When you guys reached out to us, I, I, I confess I hadn't heard too much before, but in the past week or so, I've looked through, you know, you have such a extensive list of interviews across such a broad range of nuclear issues. So it's very impressive. And yeah, there's not a ton of fusion, but some pretty good ones. So I'm happy and honored to be a part of that uh, small list. Yeah, it's awesome. Okay, yeah. So let's learn a little bit about you. Can you just tell us about you know, where you grew up and what got you interested in physics to begin with? Uh, yeah, definitely. So I, um, I'm a Canuck. I'm Canadian. I grew up in uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba. So that's a prairie town north of the Twin Cities. And uh, just as a kid, I was always interested in sci-fi, you know, reading lots of sci-fi books. Um, and then, um, you know, I wasn't particularly interested in physics, but I think, you know, I always point to my grade 10 physics teacher. Sometimes it really comes down to having the right educators. And that can really be a critical point in your development. So I had a fantastic grade 10 physics teacher who was really just imparted excitement and uh, enthusiasm. And so that got me on this, you know, thinking about physics. Um, and then on the environmental side, I've always been, you know, interested in the environment. I, you know, uh, canvassed for, for Greenpeace when I was in high school um, and, and that kind of thing. So I've always been interested in environmental issues. Um, by the time I got to college, I was I was uh, looking at physics, and uh, finally went to um, McGill in Montreal and uh, studied atmospheric physics. So that's kind of a you know a combination of an, an you know environmental topic, and you know this was in the '90s, a little bit before you know we knew about greenhouse warming gases, but it wasn't you know a predominant uh, topic as it is today. Um, so, you know, from there, um, after I got a degree in uh, atmospheric physics, went to Columbia in New York, and that's where I got into plasma physics. So I always thought of it as kind of like, you know, going up higher and higher in the Earth's atmosphere, going from atmospheric physics as you go higher up, you know, you get to the ionosphere, you know, and then all of a sudden you have weather, but hold on, you know, there is electric currents and magnetic fields going on. So there's just so much more, but you have all the complexity of the atmosphere, but then, you know, throw in Maxwell's equations to it too. And so then you get to plasma physics. Uh, and that was really fantastic. Um, but I really came at it from more of a, you know, fundamental science perspective. I wasn't necessarily thinking about fusion back then, you know, I was looking more at what you would call space plasma physics. So how, how the solar wind interacts with the earth's atmosphere um, and all those kinds of dynamics. And we worked on an experiment under uh, Professor Michael Mall, who's one of, you know, you know there, there's a titan of, of uh, nuclear for you there. Um, you know, fantastic guy in the plasma physics uh, community, working a lot on fusion. So anyways, um, you know, we also had tokamaks in the lab there and there was a lot of fusion, but it didn't really draw me yet. It was very, um, very applied for me at the time. Um, and, you know, had, you know, a strong whiff of engineering, which, you know, again, at the time I was a little bit more idealistic maybe and was looking at fundamental science. So I didn't really get too much into fusion then. So it's a pretty nonlinear road to fusion, I would say. Um, 
after my PhD, then I went more into like an accelerator physics um, area. So I, I went to CERN. Oh, great. Yes. Uh, in Geneva. For, Amazing facilities out there. Yeah. Yeah. So I was there for um, three or four years. Um, and that was also plasma physics, but a completely different area. That was low temperature plasma physics, where we actually trapped antimatter plasmas. Um, so, you know, CERN would accelerate high energy particles, generate antimatter, and then we would have this device called a penning trap where you can slow down and actually trap antiprotons. So that was super cool. Um, and was that with, um, that wasn't with Michael Dozer, was it? Um, no, he was doing one of the other experiments there. So uh, there's a few uh, competing experiments for, you know, fiercely competitive. Um, this is, I was working for the ATRAP collaboration, which um, is run by uh, Jerry Gabriels of Harvard University at the time. My postdoc was out of Harvard, but working in CERN. Uh, not, now he's at Northwestern. But um, so it was a, a competing group. Um, but anyway, we were the first group to trap antiprotons, cool them down to near uh, absolute zero, and then study them. And, and then the, the uh, end goal is to combine positrons with antiprotons and make at neutral antimatter, so anti-hydrogen, uh, and that was done. And you know, we'll talk about an energy source that would be the ultimate uh, energy source, um, even better than fusion. But that's maybe a, a few years down the road. And why why is antimatter better if you're not like in a, a spaceship where mass is so important? Why is it better? Yeah, it why, just, why is it better? Uh, it's just efficiency. So I mean, it's like the, the purest conversion. Uh, of any process from mass to energy because right, so it's, have... it's better on a mass perspective, but from like a systems perspective, if like, you oh, get... yeah, no, 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 yeah, no, <laughs> no, yeah. that, so that's what I'm saying. It's a few years down the road because if you look, um, you know, somebody figured this out in our collaboration. If you look at all the antimatter ever made on the earth, it couldn't warm up a cup of tea. So, I mean, we're, you know, you, you, there's a lot of it out there in the universe, but to produce it, it's, you know, very inefficient to actually produce it. If you have it and you annihilate an antiproton with a proton, all of that mass, 100% of that mass, it, you know, goes into energy equals mc squared. It's an annihilation event. So, yeah, anyways, but that, I, I guess, yeah, I guess my point was, so that uh, efficiency on like a mass basis makes sense when like your driving economic forces are like the mass of your fuel. Let's say like in a space, you know, travel situation where it plays so heavily into your system economics. But even if your fuel was free for antimatter, if the like the system that you had to like build around it and, uh, you know, to be able to harness that energy was more complex. Oh, yeah, uh, like CERN? Yeah, like building yeah, Right, exactly. <laughs> like you get, then it would never... Yeah. Yeah. Even if I am not arguing. Yeah, Believe yeah. me, I'm not arguing for this. We were looking at this for, you know, fundamental physics point of view, yeah, yeah. trying to prove, you know, something about what's, what's called, you know, this is the standard model of physics. We're looking at uh, charge parity time invariance, where you're trying to understand why is the universe dominated by matter instead of antimatter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so you compare, you know, charge to mass ratios of these things and some other aspects. Uh, and, you know, so far, they still look exactly the same. So, it's still, that's still a work in progress. My point of view was that's really cool, but I just loved the toys. I loved working at CERN. I loved, you know, being able to trap antimatter. You know, you see the signal on your oscilloscope and you're like, oh my gosh, that's, that's antiprotons right there. Um, so that was just super fun. And all the techniques, the experimental techniques are just uh, mind boggling and super fun. But um, maybe to continue the trajectory um, after that, uh, you know, five years or so, um, I would maybe been finally cured of my idealism. You know, I'd worked at CERN with all these fantastic physicists and really wanted to do something uh, more applied. Uh, and I was still very interested in energy, um, but we're still not at fusion yet. In fact, I took a pretty left turn <laughs> at that point. I, I took a job working for Schlumberger, which is an oil field services company um, in Boston. And, um, not that I was ever thinking of that industry at all. In fact, it was completely a surprise even to myself uh, that I went to that direction. But the folks uh, approached me there um, and you know, said, you know, we want you to work on compact accelerators, you know, really, you know, like that you can fit in your palm. Uh, really fat, cool technology. And that's all about nuclear well logging. So putting 
a source of radiation, an electronic source of radiation down a well and, and doing survey of what's around there. And, and why, um, why did they need it to be an accelerator? Why not just take you know, some other um, your radioactive isotope? And oh yeah, well, they, yeah. So that's done regularly. And uh, you know, they use cesium-137 for uh, a gamma ray source and they use yep. americium beryllium for a neutron source. Those are both uh, very strong radioisotopes. And that's been done since you know, early in the last century. Um, so what problem were they trying to solve with the accelerator? Well, the, first, there's a couple things. First of all, for, for neutrons um, and, you know, it, it, having a continuous source like americium beryllium is, is fine. But if you can chop the beam, if you can get a pulse uh, and you have a, a stop in the neutron burst, a whole bunch of other physics uh, becomes available to you because you see things like the die away of the neutrons and you can actually differentiate between certain types of signals you're getting, whether there's a, uh, a neutron absorption or a, a, a inelastic cross section, you know, there's, there's different ways that neutrons can interact with atomic nuclei. Uh, and if you can chop the beam, then you can actually differentiate all these time dependent things and you get a lot more measurements. So that's one thing, just a fundamental thing. But then first but from then a safety I, perspective. Yeah, I guess what, what does it go towards? Does it go towards um, materials characterization in the field? Is that why it needed to be small? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, practically, you're putting this thing on a wire miles underground in like a borehole that could be. Oh, you know, I see. Uses. It was for geological exploration. Geological exploration. OK, now I understand. In fact, there, there are other uses that the industry uses it for, but like it had to be also fit that purpose as well. So we're talking about a neutron generator, an electronic neutron generator. And we're, in fact, it's a fusion generator, right? It's a deuterium tritium accelerator. Uh, the size of a cigar. So you accelerate these, uh, you, you know, ionize deuterium and tritium, you accelerate them to 100 kilovolts onto a target and it undergoes fusion. So in effect, that was my um, coming back to fusion, coming back to plasma physics, but not for the energy, not for the power generated, but for the neutrons, for the high energy neutrons. So you get the neutron, you send it out, uh, it interacts with matter and you get a whole host of information. I mean, we think about, uh, you know, material assay. So like uh, an x-ray at the dentist or, you know, uh, you know, looking at using gamma rays in medicine, that gives you just density. But neutron interaction with matter gives you so much more information. And so there's a lot that you can get. Uh, and, and so that's what- and Sorry, yeah, just to do double click on that one more second, because this is super interesting stuff. I love the practical ex um, explorations of these things. Was it that they were trying to get a, like a continuous feed of data or was it, is it, was it like that they wanted to get instantaneous data? Like, like, I guess my question is in theory, whatever went down there could have just scooped something out, brought it back to the surface, sent it to a lab and done some materials characterization there. Um, so which aspect of it was th that they wanted? They wanted to be able to essentially like map but as they go or just no, no instantly. You can do that. You, you, uh, coring, they do do coring. And, and by the way, this is um, all stuff that I'm like, I don't pretend to be an expert at this. Like I, I worked on the neutron generators and um, what appeals to me, frankly, is the neutron generators, not necessarily the oil field application. Okay, we can um, move on. That's but okay. no, but you know, I can answer your question. They do do coring, uh, and but that's expensive, right? You, you take a core, you have to bring it all the way back up and you send it to the lab. And then a couple weeks later, you have something. But um, the uh, nuclear data, you can, you know, the guys sitting up there and can make real time decisions. Uh, and that goes out into, that's not just a localized measurement that, you know, the particles go out into the formation, uh, you, you know, the interact with the matter, the resulting gamma rays or x-rays come back and you measure. And so you're, you're learning something about the um, further the, out in the medium. Um, so that's why they wanted to do that. My original interest was really, like I said, I'm an, uh, an environmentalist, I do care about CO2. Um, at the time, this was 2008, um, you know, there was, you know, and carbon capture was a big deal. You know, at the time there was a bill in the Senate, the, uh, you know, American Clean Energy and Security Act, where we were going to have a carbon tax. And so, you know, carbon was going to be a huge, the source of a huge um, industry, all right? Um, and so that was exciting. And I would have been working on that because you would need to, you know, 
take carbon, put it down into the ground and then monitor it. So you'd have to have all these sophisticated monitoring of the moat, does the, is the you know, liquid CO2 moving? Is it migrating? Is it staying into place? Anyways, so I came online, but that didn't pan out. That didn't uh, pass the Senate. As you know, there's no carbon industry right now. There's no carbon tax. Uh, so I ended up working on the neutron generators and you know the technological side and the interest for me working on these neutron generators took over. And you know, so 12 years later, <laughs> I'm still uh, working in there and, and having really a great time. It's a fantastic facility they have in Boston where there's you know 150 scientists. It's really like the way industry maybe used to be like in the fashion of like your old Bell Labs where industry put a lot of investment into research. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a chemistry department, there was a nuclear physics department, there was, you know, MRI folks, geologists. Um, so that was a great place to, to be. But um, so back to the trajectory, getting back to it, that it still wasn't really fulfilling my um, desire to make a, you know, a step change in, in energy. And over those 12 years, of course, you know, things have just gotten worse and worse and worse in terms of our, you know, climate problem. Uh, so in the past few years, I've been looking to get back into fusion finally. Uh, you know, I wasn't as interested back in my PhD days, but um, now I was certainly maybe a more mature person and really wanting to apply to, you know, and, and fusion, fusion has really heated up. I mean, it's really a golden age in terms of all these startups coming online in the past uh, decade or even less. Uh, so, you know, there's been a lot of government funding, a lot of VC in the area. So it's just a super hot area right now to get into. Uh, and so there's more opportunities for, you know, back when I was finishing my PhD, there just wasn't that many opportunities either. So uh, I've been looking find, at- So did you find Zap or did they find you? Um, they found me, but I was certainly open to be found um, and had been, you know, talking to different people in the industry, uh, you know, at friends in different places, I was asking them, <clears throat> you know, and I've, spoken to different startups, spoken to Commonwealth, I've, I've spoken to TAE, spoken to different ones and definitely have friends in different uh, areas. Um, but a lot of folks that I, I spoke to just really loved Zap. That, so this is Zap Energy uh, Incorporated out of Seattle, uh, spun off from U of W, University of Washington. Uh, and they really spoke highly. Um, and so just had been talking to them for the last year and a half. I ended up coming on just at the beginning of this year. So I've been there for, what is that now? Five months. So a little bit fresh, but now I'm the director of research and development there. And what's the, what's the story um, behind Zap's origin? Do you, do you know the, the history of it? Um, yeah. So, um, so Zap uh, incorporated in 2017. So, you know, you know, fairly uh, young. Uh, but the work has been done at U of W for, you know, a couple of decades now. So, um, you know, since the 90s. So the, the three founders, um, you know, very interesting uh, guys, you know, fantastic scientists and, and entrepreneurs. Uh, the science goes back to Yuri Shumlock, who's a professor of physics at U of W and who worked on these uh, Z-pinch machines since the 90s. Uh, with uh, Brian Nelson, and now an emeritus uh, professor. He's uh, of electrical engineering. He's now left UW to be full-time uh, at ZAP. Uh, Yuri is still, is still at uh, the university, still teaching, but is a co-founder. Uh, and then uh, Benj Conway is a British entrepreneur who wanted to also get into the fusion game and been surveying back in like, the, I don't know, 2015, 2016, 2017, surveying the field and did... Uh, his due diligence and, and found these guys, uh, you know, found Yuri and found Brian at U of W and really pitched it to them. You know, they, they had already had funding, uh, significant funding from federal funding from ARPA-E. You know, ARPA-E gives a lot of funding to uh, fusion energy. So they had a pretty robust program and had already proven a lot of the physics behind the Z-Pinch. Um, they're what's called the shear flow stabilized Z-pinch, which is, you know, maybe we'll get into that. Um, yeah. uh, so they, um, you know, and did a good job convincing them. And so they incorporated in 2017, uh, closed their series A. And then we've just now uh, last week, or maybe it was two weeks ago, announced closing our series B round, which was um, really exciting, really an oversubscribed round. Uh, we continue to have 
our core funders from this round A, which actually is uh, Chevron is, is a big one. So getting back to oil and gas, it's a real trendy thing now for um, oil and gas to be funding uh, nuclear fusion, right? So uh, Commonwealth has funding from ENI and uh, maybe also Stat Oil. I'm not sure. Uh, there's another one in there. So um, you know they're doing they're doing their due diligence. They're looking at how to contribute to the energy transition. So, uh, anyways, so yeah, so we're looking to build uh, and grow really quickly right now. We're a team of twenty. I was employee nine five months ago. <laughs> so, um, and we'll be doubling in the next. 12 to 18 months as well, and trying to focus not just on the core, the fusion core, but on the reactor itself. So once you have an operating fusion core, there's a lot of auxiliary systems that uh, need to be in place and worked on. So we're, we're focusing on that. And so the money that you raised is going mostly towards engineering, or is it also to build out like a lab scale prototype of some sort? Yeah, uh, both. I would say, you know, 50-50. We have um, an existing machine, which we have moved from the U of W and we're recommissioning now, um, that will be operating soon. And then we're building a next generation machine, which will be online by the end of the year. Uh, that should take us to break even. That is, you know, energy output equals energy input. And that you know, if we achieve that, our plan is uh, 2023, the next 18 months to do that, that would be the first time, uh, not just a startup, but any um, plasma physics machine, fusion machine has done that. So it's an aggressive timeline. Um, that would not be a reactor. That would be still a, a Z machine, which is, you know, the neutrons are, you know, going off into space. We're not, there's no, you know, uh, there's no breeding blanket. There's no uh, heat transfer. There's no steam cycle yet, you know, and all that. There's no electricity conversion yet. So though all those separate ancillary systems are being worked on in parallel and being built up now with this having closed this round. I see. So the um, energy, the break even mark, is that um, energy of electricity going into the system equals the theoretical heat energy produced, but not electrical energy produced. Not electrical energy produced. It'd be the equivalent. Yeah, exactly. It's well, a measurement, it's just a heat, though, not an electricity. Yeah, not not converted to electricity. Correct. And then, is there like another term for when it's break even of like all your inputs equal all your outputs? Well, that so I mean that's still all your inputs equal all your outputs. That that's scientific break even. Then there would be you know, and that's called Q. Q equals one. Um, and then that's for that's for electricity coming in, but heat coming out. You're saying. The energy measured is is in is in heat joules of some sort. Well, it's a uh, an entire bolometry. So you're measuring the neutrons. You're taking, you know, you know, your neutrons are your money, right? So you you have for a DT reaction, uh, eighty percent of the energy comes out as neutrons, twenty percent comes out as alphas, um, and so it would be you know measuring all you know, and as well, there's also you know Bremsch drawlong from so there's gammas coming out as well. So, you know, it's basically from your neutron flux and then what would be the convertible uh, part of that that would then go into electricity. Oh, so, okay. So the convertible part, so like, let's say like 35% of it or something, that's break even when you get like, let's say two to three times as much. Well, I, I, so, sci so scientific break even, which is the lowest threshold of Q equals one, which again, has still not been uh, achieved that the, the um, the best so far, I believe, was JET, which is a Q of 0.67. So that's pretty close. Um, but again, so that's scientific break-even, and that's the lowest bar that you get to, uh, which is not taking into account you know, efficiencies. That's just purely, uh, like I said, just doing the uh, uh, what's convertible into energy without efficiencies. OK. Um... And then, uh, but it is like um, the energy coming in has to be electricity, right? It's not like it's um, a heat energy coming in. Right. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, so now tell me, you, you characterize this as a, a Z-pinch. Can you maybe um, explain what a Z-pinch is and also how it relates to some of the other fusion ideas out there? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, so a Z-pinch is, you know, sorry, let me just, um, 
get my window back into place here. Lost you there for a second. Um, so Z-Pinch has a long history in fusion. It's one of the, you know, the earliest, or maybe the earliest uh, concept that was um, looked into. And in fact, even before fusion, there's uh, some historical notes going back to, uh, you know, even the 18th century where somebody, you know, observed basically what it is, is dumping a lot of current uh, into a wire um, in its simplest. Uh, and then, you know, there were some other observations in the early part of the last century. In the 1930s, finally, a guy named Bennett really worked out the theory behind it. Um, and then for, for fusion applications, um, already in the, in the mid 40s, um, and then more seriously in the 50s, this was looked into. Um, initially in the UK, there's a lot of uh, activity there where, you know, you have a plasma device where it's basically a coaxial accelerator. You have some cylindrical geometry, an outer electrode and an inner electrode. And there's different flavors. So mostly what I'll be describing is, is, is what we do, but they're all pretty similar. Um, and so what you're doing is basically having an arc between those two electrodes and then forming a, uh, a beam, a plasma that forms along the axis between uh, those two accelerators between those two uh, electrodes. Uh, so very simple, and it's, you know, it's called a Z-pinch because it's along what's, what's known as the Z-axis. So the Z-axis is sort of the uh, long axis of your cylinder there. So it's very simple geometry. Um, and, you know, the confinement is extremely simple because there are no magnets, okay? And so that's why it was looked at, you know, the first, because it was, it's just so simple. And that's because of the Lorentz force law, right? Because you, dump, you know, your capacitor bank or something, you charge up a capacitor bank, you know, have this arc discharge inside, and then you have this thin sheet of plasma. So the current is going along the z-axis, and then by your Lorentz force law, you generate a magnetic field by having these Lorentz charges, and that goes around in what's called, you know, the theta or the phi direction. And so, you know, your right-hand rule, you just, that the, the field, um, the magnetic field makes circles going around that line of current. Now you take that one step further and you calculate the Lorentz force on that, which is um, the current crossed with the magnetic field direction. And that gives you an inward force and that's the pinch. So there's an actual Lorentz force law compressing that plasma uh, and it does it, you know, free of charge. You know, that, that field is just self, that's the self field of the plasma and it just works out. So if you increase the current, that field is pinching it smaller and smaller and smaller uh, and, and confining it. So that sounds awesome, right? Great. And there was a lot of excitement on that in the early 50s. So nothing comes for free. What's the downside? <laughs> the downside is instabilities. So this is not, you know, this is an equilibrium. And what's so nice and elegant about it is you can analytically solve this. You can write down these equations you can really understand the relationship between the current and the field, the current and the uh, pressure equilibrium and how the density looks on axis and all this stuff. And it's very elegant and you can write it down quite simply. Um, but it's not a stable equilibrium, equilibrium. So in fact, as you, you know, pump more and more current, the density goes higher and higher. Um, you have these oddly named instabilities which occur, which are particular to the, to the um, Z-pinch and they're called the kink instability and the sausage instability. Uh, and, you know, researchers- I assume those have to do with the, the shape of the instability? And, yeah, good guess. Um, so researchers saw this right away and the end result is the plasma leaks out against the magnetic field. And, and you can, there's a couple analogies I like to use against uh, for this. And one of them is, is simply just sort of like, you know, atmospheric convection, you know, like say you have like a hot day, there's a lot of hair, hot air, um, on the ground, right? And so that air is being held against the gravitational force pointing downwards. Um, you know, and every, everything's completely still, you can do that. You can have this sort of temperature inversion and you can keep hot air on the ground there. But more often than not, you know, you get convection, right? And so the air will bubble up and you'll form these, you know, very impressive um, cumulus clouds. And that is just convection. It's, it's an instability, it's a thermal instability of the hot air uh, rising up against the gravitational confinement. 
Um, so first, it's so it's you know similar, right? Where the, the plasma is sort of going unstable between the you know ra radial uh, Lorentz confinement, and, and and that's where this pinching happens or this uh, sausaging. You can or necking. It's also called a necking instability, where instead of having this nice beam, you'll form these pinching, and you'll it'll turn into like what looks like what comes out of a sausage factory, right? And so you'll pinch it here and then the sausages don't just stay as sausages, they, they balloon out even further and you're losing your fuel, right? You're losing your plasma, you're losing your yeah, inventory how, to the wall. Can you help describe, I, I think I understand the, the forces that you're creating, you know, with the, and you describe the coils of, of wire that help you pass current and everything, but what does the rest of the system look like? Is it inside a vacuum chamber? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. So it's vacuum, exactly, right? So you have an outer wall, um, and then inside that outer wall are the two electrodes. Um, and so that would be, you know, an outer electrode and an inner electrode. And those would be basically your, your cathode and your anode. Um, outside the vacuum chamber, you have a capacitor bank, which you're charging up to, you know, 100 joules of energy or something, you know, you're charging that up and it's a pulsed machine. Yep. So it's very different than a tokamak, which is a steady state. So you're pulsing this at some repetition rate. You're dumping the charge uh, across those electrodes and you're putting lots of current, you know, like hundreds of kiloamps of current. And so you have a very high current um, beam. You know, you can think of it as a beam in the plasma. And um and how do you get the fuel to line up with your pinch points? Is, is, the, is the chamber just full of both deuterium and tritium and you're hoping that they run into each other? Or do you like- So, you, so yeah, then you, now? so then it's a nice choreography uh, of you puff in gas and it'll be deuterium and tritium exactly at, you know, certain locations along the pinch. Um, and you, you know, those are, you, you make those coincide in time uh, the you know puffing of the gas and having the arc, uh, you discharging that current across. And and do you have to get all three things to meet in space at the same time? One deuterium, one tritium, and that arc all in the exact same spot? Uh, uh, not not exactly. I mean, you, you need the deuterium and tritium to meet in space, but that's what the arc is. So the, the deuterium, deuterium and tritium. Let's just let's just say hydrogen for now. So hydrogen is in there, whatever isotopes you have, whatever mixes, uh, and you that arc breaks it down. So you, you're breaking down that hydrogen um, into a current path and that, that's the ionized gas. So then those ionized, the ionized gas are ions of uh, deuterium and tritium. Um, and and that what makes your, that's what makes your current path. And so- Sorry, then, maybe you could explain that a little bit. Um, yeah, maybe sure. You explain that a little bit more. Um, you don't start off with a reservoir of deuterium, of, of tritium and a reservoir of deuterium? Of nu neutral gas, of neutral gas, yes. A bottle, you have a bottle of it. Uh, outside. But, your, uh, sorry, they mix together, or have you already done some sort of isotopic separation? Oh, in like in an actual reactor. Uh, well, let, let's get to that. Let's 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 set that aside. Let's let's just get the the formation of the pinch down. Don't worry about whether it's deuterium or tritium. It works either way. We can like now we work with de deuterium and deuterium and deuterium fuse also and also. Oh, I see. Up. So you're uh, you're not specifying a certain fusion reaction. You're just letting whatever happens happen. Ultimately, when we talk about, we'll talk about the react. I, I just want to make, I just want to confuse the, the, the issues. Um, we will be running deuterium tritium, definitely. Um, that, that, that's the reaction that we will be using for sure. I'm just, I just want to make sure if the question you had was on like the formation of the Z pinch itself. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm more interested in like the physical parameters of the system. So let's say in the eventual reactor, you've got a deuterium, you've got a tritium, they have to hit each other, they have to be co-located with each other, right? Yeah, so that, and that's where you have, so that, that's inside the pinch. Those are ions that are forming the current of the pinch uh, and they are co-located because we are having an extre extremely high density. So this magnetic field confines the pinch. Uh, it and makes the density go extremely high. So, so to give you a sense of it, the, the, the pinch is, uh, you know, say it's 50 centimeters long and it's sub-millimeter. So you're confining it so much so that this beam, the radius of this beam is sub-millimeter, so hundreds of microns. Uh, so it's very high density, high temperature. Within that, the fusion reactions are happening within that pinch. It's not like it's a target downstream. It's not uh, you know, another form of 
uh, fusion you could have, like what I did with, with Slumber Day was uh, a, a beam target fusion where just those ions hit a target. This is happening inside the plasma, inside the pinch. So those deuterium tritium ions are being confined uh, at high density and that's why they are encountering each other with lots of collisions and some of those collisions are fusion collisions. I see. And then how do you make sure though that um, they don't run into, so if, if you put a bunch of deuteriums in, a bunch of tritiums in, how do you make sure that it's a deuterium and a tritium that hit each other and not do two deuteriums that hit each other? I understand you can demonstrate how it would still work with two deuteriums, but in your eventual reactor, um, how do you make sure you get what you want going in? Uh, yeah, they just do that themselves. Uh, that's, it's very nice of them. It's just because deuterium tritium, the cross section or the reactivity, you can think of it is just so much higher, which is why you use deuterium tritium. Uh, otherwise you'd use, let's just say DD and DT from now on. Otherwise you'd use DT, DD <laughs> because, you know, tritium is a little bit of a headache, but uh, DT has just a great cross section. It's the highest of any, uh, you know, of these uh, hydrogenic fusion reactions. Um, and it gives you the highest energy neutron. There's just lots of reasons why you do that. And, and so they just do that themselves just because the reactivity is, is higher. Yeah, I'd, I'd be less worried about the deuterium deuterium because that would produce tritium, right? I'd be more worried about the if you do deuterium tritium, now you got a helium there. What do you do to make sure that helium isn't like parasitic on your reaction? Yeah, um, so, I mean, uh, that's a really good question. And um, actually, I just listened to the one you did with Dennis White, and he explained the uh, uh, helium ash uh, issue and how you, you know, pump that out. It's a little bit different for us um, because, again, we're not steady state. We're pulsed. And so these things last for, you know, a few tens of microseconds. So you know, it's not as much of an issue. And also for us, it's not immediately clear as we move towards higher current uh, and above break even whether uh, the alphas are, you know, confined uh, or not. And so the, you know, an, an alpha that's not confined just hits the wall. Um, and it's, you know, not, not a huge issue for us. Um, but, uh, you know, we are looking into that uh, as well. And maybe I'll leave that particular topic for there at the moment. That's, that's a work in progress, which we'll, we're, we'll no let problem. you know about soon. Yeah, cool. And then I guess the other question I have is like, what is the theoretical like rate of reactions that you can have in this, you know, whatever geometry system you define, let's say, you know, 50 centimeters long or something. What is like the maximum theoretical? And let's say you had all your capacitors ready to go. How many of these reactions, or how much energy could you produce in this device? Is yeah, well, yeah. Let's just let's just go straight to the bottom line and uh, skip the reactivity and talk about what the power plant output looks like and how close we are. Does that sound? Well, good? yeah, you know, I, uh, I guess I just want to know, I, like the yeah, like the theoretical bounding conditions for this, let's say, fifty centimeter vacuum chamber device. Well, okay, so we're missing a key step, which which is why is this work now and it didn't work in the fifties? So I think we kind of skipped over that. Which is, you know, that's sort of the bread and butter of ZEI is is why. Why are we looking at Z-pinches again? Um, and so, how, and this is going back to the instability. Um, like I said, they, so they quit basically in the 50s looking at this and, and uh, <clears throat> went to helical confinement, you know, so tokamaks, for example, stellarators and field reverse configurations and these types of things, because those types of field lines are closed field lines. They loop back around each other um, uh, and it solves these, these particular instability issues at the cost of having uh, expensive set of external magnetic fields. Um, whole other topic we can talk about, but uh, let's focus on the Z-pinch for now. And I think this is one of the key advantages, right? Uh, again, you don't have the magnetic fields if you can keep it stable. So how do you, you know, how do you prevent this uh, uh, cumulonimbus cloud, right? From uh, escaping from the earth and giving you convection. So uh, it turns out, and Yuri did this seminal work in the nineties, that if you can have a sheared flow, so if you can have a flow in the other direction, say, uh, you know, parallel to the Earth's surface in this analogy that I'm making with convection, so that there's no flow on the Earth's surface, but and then as you go up higher and higher, you're getting faster and faster and faster flow. So it's sort of tangential flow. So this is called this uh, sheared flow stabilization. Turns out if you do that, you're sort of interfering with the coherence of this instability you're mixing phases and you're, you're destroying the coherence of the mode. Uh, and so that was done in theory. And then um, in the early 2000s, they did this. They, they proved that if you put on just a simple flow uh, in the geometry of the Z-pinch, they stabilized 
uh, the pinch. So you can look at you know one of these shots, and this is this is published. Uh, all this is published. We're not super secretive about the science, and you can look at the uh, the publication record there. But you look at like a a shot, and you know you dump the current uh, into the plasma and say it's you know I don't know let's say it's 100 kiloamps for this particular shot. The current goes up. Now you can measure these instabilities by looking at a uh, certain diagnostic. You can see the activity um, and they have a certain frequency content and you can see all this noise. As the current's going up, you see all this noise and it's unstable. And then once it hits a certain plateau, you know, uh, it suddenly goes away. It all becomes perfectly quiet. And you get what's called this quies quiescent period and the, the instabilities go away. And then lo and behold, during this quiescent period on your neutron monitors, all this activity starts coming up and you start getting tons of fusion reaction neutrons, you know, and that's your, uh, that's your, your sign of fusion there. And so they've studied this a lot in the last decade. Uh, so this shear flow stabilized Z-pinch um, is working. And now where we're at, um, just to give you a sense of where that is in relation to break even. So, yeah, and just one more question on that. What is yeah. the, um, so like, what is the driving like physical parameters that allow you to achieve the stability? So it's, it's this flow, you have a certain, it's a certain uh, criterion and you, and you can, you know, solve, look at, you can look at this equilibrium and just analytically look and you can see that if you have a certain shear flow rate, the, 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 um, uh, the shear of it, you know, the gradient of the flow has to be above a certain level. It has to be shearing it fast enough, right? Um, and then you get this decoherence of these modes and a, and a stabilization. So that's the parameters, the metric. Yeah, but I guess I'm, I'm wondering, like, what are the physical parameters by how you, like, can configure the system in a way that it has this shear flow? Is it right. that you well, I mean, the, the pulses at the right frequency? Is it that you have the right thickness of cable? What are the, what are the driving physical parameters for your so, system? Yeah, I mean, so a lot of that is the secret sauce of, of ZEI, which, which is our, you know, our secret sauce. So we don't want to talk too much about that, but it's definitely a lot to yeah, do but, with it. Yeah, I, I don't need to give away a secret sauce, but I'm just wondering if it is it computational or is it materials based or like, what is the thing that has allowed this that didn't allow it previously? Like I can imagine like you've got now, in nowadays we have computers that can help, you know, maybe like read some feedback from what's going on in the system and then maybe kind of calibrate the pulses and understand how it's calibration um, might, you know, yield to this, um, this, uh, this more yeah. steady state. Is it something like that or is no, it's it more elegant than that? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's engineering, it's engineering and it's plasma physics. So it's, it's, it's not uh, any complicated feedback during a plasma shot or anything like that. It's building the machine in such a way as to produce the shear that you want. Okay. So it's just ge geometric you're saying. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Geometric fundamental to the machine. It's not, uh, it's not any like AI or it's, it's not any feedback or anything like that. It's, it's a very, um, elegant, simple machine. And, and, you know, I visited many, um, well, they're not reactive, yes, but many facilities, uh, and you'd be surprised to see the simplicity. This is a machine that is the size of, you know, a VW microbus, for example, um, you know, pretty small, um, and with no terawatt lasers, no high temperature superconducting magnets, um, yeah, it's just a co coil of wires, but you're saying they have to be calibrated at just the right geometries, essentially. Yeah, you, you have to build it right. It's, it's, you know, it's metal, it's engineering metal in the right way. Um, and it's building the capacitor banks, which are not nothing. I mean, that pulse power is certainly uh, a key core technology of ours as well. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it, doing all this in, in the right way, for sure. Got it. Um, okay, yeah, sorry, we were a little on diversion. I guess my question... Um, okay, yeah, you were saying VW bus. So this VW bus, maybe this is your prototype, uh, the full scale system about how big would it be and how much power would it produce? Yeah, it would be, you know, uh, you know, a, a VW uh, microbus hot dog. So you'd have the VW as your, you know, your hot dog and then you'd have a bun around it. So it's like basically three meters by three meters. So it's a cylinder of say three meters by three meters. So it's like a garage. Um, and so you have the reactor and around the reactor, well, let, let's talk about the reactor for a second. So what's, what's, what's nice about this and what's very different from all the other different, um, um, not applications, all of the other attempts uh, at doing this is the fact that you have no magnets. So the fact that you have no magnets means you don't have to protect the magnets from neutrons. 
So the other thing that all of us have, all, all these fusion reactors have, is a way to convert neutrons. If it's neutronic, okay, let's not talk about a neutronic just yet. If it's neutronic, you need to convert the neutrons, and you typically do that in a in a blanket, what's called you know a um, tritium blanket, where you take take the neutrons, and it does a bunch of things. It converts neutrons to heat. Uh, then you have some kind of you know thermal uh, transport, and this is a liquid metal, and so we'd have a liquid metal. Uh, where, which does all that. That liquid metal in this case would be lithium lead. Um, and those act, they, and they do all these things. They convert neutrons to heat. They breed tritium. That's what the lithium is there for. So you have a closed cycle where we don't buy tritium. We make our own tritium. It, it acts as a radiological neutron shield. So no neutrons get out of that. And, and this is theoretically, is this breeding happening in situ or is there like right. a process where you have to remove the helium at some point, process it, distill it and then get it back into the system. No, it's it's a closed cycle. Um, and, you know, again, we don't have this. And, and this would, this is, uh, I wouldn't call it cookie cutter, but this would be similar to, this part specifically would be similar to other folks, you know, like Eater would have that or Commonwealth would have it. Anybody running DT is going to have a similar type of uh, steam cycle arrangement. They're going to have a uh, an area where you would do isotopic separation of the tritium and then feed that back into the system. So a closed, a closed loop there. What's different for us is that our liquid is gonna be part of the core itself. It'll act as an electrode. So it's a conducting medium, which is very cool. So it means that our, now we have just a metal wall for our outer electrode. In the reactor, our outer wall is actually gonna be this liquid metal wall. It's right there. Sorry, um, this that wall. Might be a bit complicated, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to visualize it for a second. Is there, um, is it literally directly in that vacuum or, uh, and being like pushed up against the outside of it? Or is there like another like really thin piece of like stainless steel or something that, that uh, forms a chamber? No, it? no, it's in the vacuum. And, and this has been done before by a few folks. Uh, it's been studied before. Uh, it's not necessarily our, our idea. Uh, we are just, you know, it's, it's been studied a lot. Um, and, and does the geometry of this wall matter, or is it? Oh just... yeah, I mean the geometry. So you have the cylinder now. Now now the cylinder instead of being horizontal, it's kind of down. So you have a flow of this wall that goes down over like what you'd call a waterfall. Of course, this is very dense liquid. It's lead, so it's not like it's splashing around or anything like that. It's a very um, thick, um, viscous uh, liquid. And, and, and so it's and it's flowing over what is is it like a stainless steel barrier behind it or something. Uh, yeah, I mean, the it's called a weir wall. Um, the actual engineering of it, I'd defer to one of our engineers to describe, but uh, this would be uh, something like that. You can envision it as just like a very smooth waterfall. And there's and, and there's no problem like with corrosion, especially especially with the potential difference that you're creating, the like the liquid lead having some corrosive effect on whatever physical barriers holding it up? Um, not that we know of so far. I mean, there have been studies on this, but it's not, uh, you know, this is not nothing. You, the, there are studies that have to be done, material studies, and then looking at the ablation of this, you know, high power uh, plasma dumping power into this thing. Uh, but again, a lot of studies, and I'm not an expert on this particular aspect. I'm more the, uh, the, pla the plasma physicist guy. So um, we have people working on this and what you would do then is, you know, convert the neutrons. This would be a flowing thing. So you'd, you'd have the heat coming out of there. You'd breathe the, the tritium. And it's quite simple because, again, you're not having to protect any magnets. And that's what's critical in like things like tokamaks. You have, you know, I, I've seen amazing presentations from some of our uh, competitors, uh, which, you know, they're fantastic, but they have, you know, the hot, they, almost uh, advertise that they have the highest thermal gradients in the universe. Well, that looks like a, a risk to me where you have the hottest medium in the universe and then, you know, centimeters away, you have some of the coldest because you have, well, it's not that high temperature, but it's a high temperature superconducting magnet. So it's still at, you know, tens of Kelvin. Um, and you have to protect that, not just from the heat load, but also from the neutron flux. Yeah, the neutron is what I'd be more worried about. And so how do you guys, um... Uh, protect your coil of wire from neutron as well. We don't have any coil of wire. There's no wire. Or sorry, so not a coil of wire. There's oh, there's no wire in the in the middle. There's no of this wire. The, the current is, okay. is is the plasma. So you have just metal electrodes. Or once you get to the react, and so sorry, you, have to, the, yep. you want an anode and a cathode. You're saying, or or yep. what we, correct. correct. 
Well, um, think of it as like a, again, a cylindrical geometry, like a coaxial cable, you know, so you have an outer, uh, an outer anode, yeah. and then along the axis is an inner electrode, that inner electrode stops at some point, and where that inner electrode, which is at the cathode, stops is where the beam starts. If I could draw this for you, I, I, it's, it's very easy. It maybe sounds more complicated than it is. It's pretty simple. Yeah, um, and so is, is one material the anode and one and a different material the, the cathode? Yeah, there'll be different materials and certainly the, the uh, inner electrode will see a, a lot of heat flux and that would be the one thing that would be something that you would have to replace. Okay, so sorry, that's what I meant. I, when I said wire, I just meant whatever the inner electrode is. Yeah. Um, right. So the inner electrode is not your lead, your, your liquid lead material, right. it's something else. Right. No, that's, that's a hard, that's gonna be like, you know, graphite, for example. Um, it's gonna be graphite. Uh, and then, oh, I didn't realize graphite could conduct enough current. That's interesting. Um, okay, and then, um, and then, but I guess, the, so the neutrons have two problems. The first is that they would, you know, in theory, degrade the material, and then you have to replace the material. I understand when your materials are those really expensive magnets, that could be a, uh, a killer for that type of project, and that's where the, the neutrons could cause serious damage there. But what about the, the other aspect of the, the, the neutrons doing enough um, damage, not from like a physical structural perspective, but creating yet more instabilities by just changing like the, the atomic lattice of whatever your cathode is? Oh, geez. No, I mean, it's not going to, we'd certainly change it out uh, before anything like that happened. There's still um, a lot of work to be done on plasma material interaction. And that's something that we definitely piggyback on. I mean, everyone is doing that in the industry, um, you know, particularly, you know, you know, folks at Eater having a, a huge center for that. So we're doing some of it, but the whole industry is looking at this, um, you know, especially, you know, tokebacks are looking at diverter materials and, um, activating, you know, their, you know, all, all of their, you know, inner walls. So our problem is a little bit, quite a bit more manageable since it's just this one, the tip of this uh, inner electrode that would have to be changed up. But again, this is still, uh, you have to do work on, on materials and, and that would be something that would be swapped out at some point. And then, but the, I, I think it's a little bit easier for us because what we're, you know, looking at is a modular reactor. So, you know, once you get to, um, commercial break even that's like a q of 20 or something um I see, that, that was the number i was looking for before um oh. we we're talking about break even okay so you, your name for it is commercial break even yeah uh, the whole industry talks about this there's you know scientific then engineering then commercial um and when you get to something commercial um our scale up we need to scale up by about of a factor of three in, in current to get there it's not it's not like we're orders of magnitude away like right now we're say at at the area of 500 kiloamps. So, and, and commercial takes into account your um, your heat to electricity conversion cycle. Is what you're saying? Yeah, that's got everything in, in there. Um, and you know, and, and that's you know, that's an that's an estimate, right? There's still some several unknowns, but approximately we are looking at 1.5 megaamps. So it's a factor of three in current we're scaling up from now to then. So it's not that far away. And incidentally, scientific break even, which would be again the first ever. Uh, is a, a roughly 600 or more. So we're going from 500 to 600 and we're at break even. And okay, so, okay, so that was in, in current. What about in terms of like, in terms of watts? Like what, what power uh, system is this? Oh, scientific. I mean, these things scale extremely strongly. So what's interesting in the z pinch is that the, the neutron production, the fusion output scales to the 11th power of current. So it's got this amazingly strong uh, current uh, dependent. So right right now at scientific break even, you know, it's fairly useless. Yeah, no, no, I, I meant for um, commercial break even. Yeah, okay. So that's what getting back to that. So that's what I, what I was going to say. Uh, so we look at a two hundred uh, megawatt core, uh, and then the idea would be to have it modular. So depending on what you want, if you want like I don't know a gigawatt reactor, you'd have several of these yeah. things online. Yeah, and fission, and they talk about the same type of thing. So again, fission, right? It's a modular yeah. reactor. Yeah. And okay, so you've got um, 200 megawatts and something the size of a, uh, you were saying that that mini bus or something. That's that's the, I, that's what we can think of when we think of this fusion core. Correct. And then it's got you know, walls and it's got you know, liquid lead flowing down and you've got a capacitor bank and you're pumping energy in and then, you know, and then some cycle where it's getting your, your tritium back and this whole thing is ongoing. And then all of a sudden 
crank it up a little bit more and now you get a, a little extra electricity out. Is that well, the idea? I, we wouldn't be cranking that at that point. This is just in, in the science phase, we're cranking up the, the current, um, you know, and making sure we understand the science as we go up in current, making sure we understand the output and all these things, making sure we understand the engineering. Once you've gotten to, you know, Q equals 20, then you're designing a reactor and you have it at a fixed current. You don't, you're not messing around with the current there. <clears throat> and then you have, you know, th then you're commercial. And then you have a reactor. Let's say you want, if you want your, you know, gigawatt reactor, you have whatever, you know, five, 10 of these cores. Um, and if you need to swap something out, it's modular. So one of them goes down. It's not like a um, tokamak, which is continuous and you've got one of them, right? If you need to service that thing, the whole plant comes down uh, or it's not like a, you know, large uh, fission reactor. So the modularity of it, um, it is key. So you swap out your inner electrode, but you know, nine, ten, nine out of 10 of his buddies are still running. Or you can have, you know, and this is another application is a much smaller, just your 200 megawatt core. So <clears throat> you can think about microgrid, you can think about remote applications, you could think about, you know, one skyscraper, um, you can think about different applications. And of course, you can also think about space travel uh, and propulsion, which is another key advantage of the, uh, the Z-Pinch. But that's, and maybe that's another topic. And then, um, okay, so you're pumping all this current through. Is there, I understand that you don't have magnets in, as part of your system, but is there a magnetic moment created in the system? Um, well, I mean, during operation, so this, this is a pulse. Yeah, like I cross J type stuff, yeah, that type of thing. Right, so that's what, <clears throat> that's what the, the um, excuse me, <clears throat> confinement is, is the plasma current axial along the Z direction crossed, I say this word crossed, that's, you know, vector multiplication there, um, crossed with the um, confining um, azimuthal magnetic field. And that gives, that's what gives you this <clears throat> J cross B force, this radially inward pinch. Is that the question? Y yes, but I guess I was, um, I wanted to understand, so you've got this, um, you're going to have this at the 200 megawatt level. So it's going to, you're going to have like 200 megawatts worth of like magnetism also being created. What's mm -hmm. the effect on the structure of your reactor? You're like, oh, well, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, good point. I mean, you want to um, have, you know, non ferromagnetic magnetic materials, but also the field is very local. <clears throat> you know, the field um, is the, the pinch, for example, is like I said, sub millimeter. So the field, if you solve it, <clears throat> excuse me again, uh, is zero on axis. It goes up to its peak at the pinch radius, sub millimeter, and then dies away. And so, but you're saying it's like perfectly counterbalanced, even at those higher levels, like the 200 megawatt level of current being. Oh, in produced. terms of like instabilities or something like that. No, I, mean, I just, I just mean like where are the force, like if there, you have this magnetism, you know, for every force, there's an equal opposite, you know, reaction type. Of, where's all that force going? The um, I understand it's going to confine something, but that means there's also like a structural material that has to like support like that level of magnetism also, right? Well, I mean, so it's all it's all self-consistent, right? The, the 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 current itself is creating that magnetic field. So um, certainly, if you have, but doesn't that magnetic field like, doesn't push back on on the wires, the electrodes in some way? Well, it pushes back. I mean, you could you could think of the plasma. I mean, just let's pretend it's solid instead of so. Let's say you let's say, let's say you have a hundred kiloamps going through a solid wire. Um, those kink instabilities and those sausage instabilities would be doing something to that, and it would be bending metal. Exactly. And, so that's what I'm saying. So you have 200 megawatts worth of bending metal energy in your reactor. Yeah, so you don't have it at that location for sure. That's why you don't have a solid. Right, right, but you have to build something around it is what I'm trying to get to, right? You have to build a, like a wall around your reactor yeah. that has enough steel in it that's capable of withhold, with, with sure. Yeah, not non-ferromagnetic stainless steel yeah. uh, is, is the outer chamber and you're, you're, you're not going to have, you know, uh, anything like that. And then of course the fields are much smaller at that wall. We can put that wall wherever we want again. And that comes down to the fact that there's no external magnetic fields because you know, your external magnetic fields for a tokamak, you want them as close as possible, but uh Oh, there's all those neutrons and there's all, this, there's all that heat and you have to have the, the breeding material in between. So you have to place that all, you know, together the best you can for us. We can place the outer wall wherever we want. Uh, because there's no external magnetic field. So you can optimally place it 
as far as you want. And in fact, the, the outer wall is not at anywhere close, if we want, to the pitch. It's uh, quite a ways out, you know, at least an order of magnitude out. So the field is way down at that point. So yeah, you're not bending anything. If you do have anything close to it, yeah, metal's gonna see that and it's gonna not like it. And we've seen bent pieces of metal um, <laughs> and uh, we, we try to avoid that. Um, you've seen them at the like the laboratory scale at the at the very small power scale. Yeah, yeah, at the laboratory scale. Sure. Yeah, that's what I was just, that's what I was trying to get to. I'm trying to imagine as these systems scale up, what are the other structural considerations of the system that you have to define? Like, I always like to think about. Okay, so like, great, we've got. I'm actually assuming that we've got the physics worked out. I'm already jumping two steps ahead. Yeah. How do we like? How do we deal with material properties like you know corrosion? How do we deal with like the, the structure of the system? And then can we um, start, you know, conquering those issues in parallel with some of the remaining oh, physics so questions. I would say, yeah, I mean, um, so I, I love the fact that you're jumping past the physics, um, and I, I, I hope that's totally right. We still have a few things to work out, um, but we're on a good trajectory. As far as engineering and, and as far as material, the, the highest risk thing, I think, are, um, like I said, the plasma material interaction itself. So these inner um, electrodes, and the durability of them. And we're doing work right now on identifying you know, durable uh, materials that can withstand the uh, heat and the bombardment and the ablation of the plasma for as long as you can. And again, for us, that is a smaller problem than, than most of our, our, our other friends because it's just this one uh, point, this one situation on the, the end of the inner electrode. But th yeah, that's a key risk. And as far as on the materials and engineering side, that's one risk, I would say. Uh, and then another um, risk is the pulse power. What we're doing now is we can we can take a shot, say, every 10 minutes. And uh, you know a key technology that we're working on is we need to do that more quickly. So we need to develop pulse power that has a repetition rate much faster, like at one hertz or I'd say 10 hertz or something like that. So you're doing it every second or every 10th of a second. And so that's but, a key engineering. So there would have to be a lot of pinches happening even in that um, one in, in that 10 hertz range to be able to get up to 200 megawatts though. No, so that so the, the pinch exists in, in that one hertz, in that, so you do in every shot that you take is say a hundred microsecond pinch. And so the current, the current is dumped across that amount of time, the gas is put for that amount of time, the plasma exists for that amount of time, and then the neutron production and the heat is produced for that amount of time. Yeah, I guess what I'm wondering is how much of your fuel is, in, like how much mass is converted to energy in, within, that, within that one pinch? Oh, you mean of the deuterium and tritium? Yeah, like, like you, so you got that one pinch. Is it just one deuterium atom and one tritium atom? Oh, no, 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 no. This is, you know, this is extremely high densities of, you know, 10 to the 25 per, you know, cubic meter. I mean, very, very high density, you know, not solid matter density, but uh, very high dense plasma, high density. But we plasma. also have to, um, but like per pinch, enough of those have to also line up, like the literal deuterium and the literal tritium have to, like, they have to pair. So, like, yeah, there has no, to be. Yeah. Right. The, the scalings that, I, that I, we've been talking about are all based on um, what we've already done and then small extrapolations from what we've already done. So, I mean, the amount of current and the amount of neutron production we've already seen, like I've said, we've already demonstrated 500 kiloamps of plasma pinch current. So uh, that's sorry, how, many, how many watts of, is that, does that produce? Uh, that's a good question. Like I said, the, the fusion power scales to the 11th power of current. So it's, you know, minuscule at this point. And so if you go up to the, um, uh, and, and you know, I, I should know that, but when you go up to commercial and you scale to 1.5, it's like around 1.2 to 1.5 mega amps. So a factor of two and a half to three from where we are now, that's what gives you, um, that's what scales to the 200 megawatt. Core. It's a direct, a direct scaling of current performance to, yeah. to that. Yeah, I, I was more thinking, um, what is the scaling of, of mass? Like, you're going to have to get, um, I understand how the, the current has this, like, you know, huge. Oh, yeah, okay. The amount of mass injected isn't changing. It's the density, the amount of, the amount of current. When you increase current, that, that means more mass of plasma. That means just more plasma. So, I see. So you're you're increasing the um, the likelihood that any two uh, any deuterium and tritium will find itself within that pinch. Yeah, 
Exactly. Yeah. So, so um, I know I, I remember um, you know Dennis White talking about the triple product, right? Uh, so it comes down to that again. It's the same game no matter what you're doing in terms of fusion, but the triple product, you know, it, you know, hot enough for long enough and dense enough for as many. So each each one has to be hot enough to make it happen. So that's the reactivity for long enough allows you more and more and more of them. And that's also the density part gives you more and more and more of them. So um, when you go up in current, you do all three of those things in a pinch at the same time. You get it hotter, you get it denser. Um, well, and then the time is, you know, the time. Yeah, is no, I, I get how the, the physics part scales. I'm more worried uh, or not worried. I'm just more interested in how like the rest of the system scales. Cause you're talking about like going up like six orders or maybe more nine orders of magnitude in terms of energy being produced at any given yeah, moment. Well, that, that comes for free with the increase in current. So let's, you know, let's go back to that. So you're increasing current by a factor of three. Um, but that because of the plasma physics, it's the same charges in there, but they're hotter. Uh, and the density is going up a lot more. So that just means you're getting more and more fusion reactions within that plasma. Yeah, and then once again, I'm thinking outside of the literal reaction zone, but now you've got these huge pulses of let's say neutrons that are being produced. Um, yeah. And how does, how does a pulse of, of that many neutrons maybe interact with the materials as opposed to, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's yeah, I mean, so again, that, that's, that's, that's neutron interaction with the metal wall, which is a much simpler pro problem than neutron interacting with, you know, uh, any type of magnet. Uh, so it's really, it's interacting with a passive material. So that means you have the choice of designing that material fit for purpose to do that. And we have materials that are, that um, can withstand neutron bombardment. You have that uh, in, you know, in different industries, certainly in the fission industry as well, right? So there's a lot of work over decades of, yeah. of all this. And I'm not a material scientist, but that means we are, have the freedom to design this electrode fit for purpose for exactly what you just said to withstand that neutron bombardment. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah, I know in the fission industry, one of the things that they found was that, you know, not every material is perfect, right? Like on paper, you can say, oh, this is 100% graphite or 100% this, 100% that, but everything, including, you know, metal alloys. So you go to your, your steel guy and you say, hey, I want stainless steel. And he's like, okay, great. Here's some stainless steel. But not every stainless steel is the same and it's got different, you know, slightly different rates of alloy material. Sure. And then like, and what the fission industry found that tripped them up for a while was they were welding, you know, with a, um, a weld filler material that had a copper alloy and then under heavy neutron bombardment, what they would find is that the little copper bits would like, like to move, you know, because you're rattling the lattice cage and these things you know, tend to aggregate towards each other and then find and then create these pockets of copper and that would embrittle the material. And so that was like an issue they had to work over like, you know, 10 years and that kind of stuff. But so many, so many interesting lessons learned that I hope you guys are able to, to benefit from. Um, oh yeah, that. no, uh, yeah. Uh, material science is, is hugely important in this. And, um, you know, we, uh, we, we try to recruit the best material scientists, but so is everybody right now. I mean, like I said, it's really a golden age in fusion. And so uh, people are thinking of the physics, but you know, just as many people are thinking about the engineering and about the material science. And so, you know, those are the people, you know, and, you know, and fusion, um, you know, if you know, things will, you know, if things don't go right, then it'll remain physics. But if things go right, then it's engineering, right? You know, so the trajectory of this effort is necessarily going to turn into nuclear engineering, right? Um, like I said, not a ton of physicists are working on fission right now. That's not a bad thing. That means the nuclear engineers are doing it. So fusion, the trajectory has to be the same. And so, you know, electrical engineers, material science people, uh, all these folks uh, are coming on board in, in droves to, to, to solve these problems. And then everything else you're saying is like a standard steam, a steam Rankin, you know, uh, convert, you know, uh, energy. For DP, yeah, for neutronic fission, it's a standard. So that's not reinventing the wheel. And if you're which is great. And, and then I'm so I'm wondering, have you guys done now an economic analysis where you say, let's just assume we've got the, the fusion reactor right. Can we price out, but knowing the characteristics of it, hey, you know, we're assuming the reaction is going to scale up exactly like we want. We've got all the stability we want. All right, now let's run the analysis. How much is you know material in it? What's the size of the room? Yeah. 
you know, what's the engineering, you know, to kind of protect the area from neutrons. Let's plug that into now a power plant economic model and see what's the um, what's the LCOE, what's the cost of the electricity that yeah, we're Yeah, right, right. So everybody has to have that model. Um, it's just, you know, it goes along with the game and, and you know, any, uh, any stakeholder or any investor is going to ask you about that. Um, and, you know, to tell you the truth, I think a lot of it is a little bit of um, BS, but you know, you do your best. There's a there's a lot of unknowns, um, and so you know, yeah, we've done that, um, and we've also uh, you know uh, hired some you know ex external um, assist assistance from um, engineers to look at that, and you know, we have an LCOE of you know you know we've calculated five cents per kilowatt hour, but you know. I'm not going to stand by that necessarily. There's a lot between here and then. And I think if anybody tells you what their LCOE is in the fusion industry, you should treat it the same way. So uh, there's, there's a lot of mileage between now and there. And um, I think it's going to be fantastic. But the, you know, the other advantages are, are clear. Uh, and it's going to be a trajectory. It's going to you know, take maybe a little bit longer for the LCOE to get down there, but it's going to get down there. And you know, I can quote that to you, but I'm, I'm put a big asterisk on there, yeah. just to be oh, honest. That's fine. I think that's a fine place to start also. It seems to make sense, you know, given other, you know, uh, similar capital uh, infrastructure projects. Yeah. Just, you know, Everybody can go through that. Everybody goes through that uh, analysis and uh, we all make similar assumptions, but, you know, it's, it's you know, there's huge unknowns there still and, and it's still early days in terms of that. And then I guess, um, uh, last question on this front, just because, you know, in the, in the fission industry, it's like such a nightmare dealing with um, the regulators. Does the NRC get involved um, because of all the neutrons? Um, yeah, definitely. And th there's a lot of effort going on right now uh, with the NRC. And, you know, there's like this, this budding um, lobbying group, um, which is just sort of starting for fusion. Um, and gosh, it's not on the tip of my tongue. The FIA and um, fantastic guy who's running it right now. I, I wish I could mention his name. Anyways, uh, there's a lot of work now trying to learn from what Fission uh, went through and is still going through and will go through uh, and try to avoid that, learn from it. And to really, the, the problem for Fusion is gonna be to communicate the differences, not just to the regulatory bodies, but also to the public. You know, There's a lot of fear uh, a lot of it is unfounded, even on the fission side, in my point of view, I'm, 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 yeah. a, I'm a fan of fission. Uh, you know, we have the solution to the carbon problem right in front of our eyes. Hello. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of fear, but um, so we need to communicate. It's hard to imagine that fission is going to, you know, recover fully from this perception, uh, whether it's warranted or not. But, but fusion has to learn from that. And we've got to do a, a good job of teaching the public. And we've and there are some key differences, though. Right. I mean, there's a lot less danger, this is not a, um, a uh, critical, you know, we can't go critical. It's not a um, chain reaction. We don't have long lived isotopes for tens of thousands of years. So there's a lot of key differences we need to communicate to regulatory bodies so that it's not regulated in the same way. Right now, um, if you didn't do anything, it might be regulated the same way, but we need to get it to a point where it's regulated more like uh, an accelerator. You know, like the amount of radiation is gonna be less uh, at a tokamak and say you're producing at like a light source or an accelerator facility that already exists today. Yeah, I think I think though the um, the concern of the regulators isn't just the like the radiation, it's literally just the amount of neutrons produced. And um, and fusion actually probably, oh, I know it does, it exceed on a per energy basis, it exceeds fission in terms of neutrons produced. So um, I guess my question would be on the like neutrons produced source. I, I, the regulators are constantly worried about, let's say, proliferation issues, because if you have a lot of neutrons, you know, you hold up a, a blanket of depleted uranium next to it, all of a sudden you've got plutonium. Um, are those part of like the conversations in terms of your engineering as well? How do we design this thing to be proliferated? I mean, there's no, there's no proliferation danger here. What are you going to do with, uh, I mean, in any, in any um, kind of a fusion reactor? And, and by the way, you know, this is, uh, you know, a, a stiff competition. We have a lot, but if anybody else wins it, uh, fantastic, right? I mean, everybody just wants fusion to be to commercialized. So, but, in it, you know, just wanted to throw that out there. But in any of these configurations, uh, yeah, like I said, there's there's no proliferation issues here. There's no 
uh, issue for um, some nefarious person, you know, stealing radioisotopes for even creating a dirty bomb or anything like that, or for yeah, no, I wouldn't be worried about any of that stuff. I would just be worried about all the extra neutrons um, being. Oh yeah, able but the neutrons are you know, short lived. Those are short lived. You, you, I mean, you're worried for radiation. You're worried about long lived radioisotopes. The no, no, no. I, I think the concern, at least from the regulators, how they've expressed it to me, is if you have a production of neutrons. You can, you can use that, like your blanket right now could essentially, part of the blanket could be replaced with a, like a uranium-238 panel. And that uranium-238 panel over time would be a plutonium-239 panel. And then you, that's what, that's what the regulars have expressed to me at least, is their proliferation concern, specifically with anything that creates abundant neutrons. Okay, well, I mean, like, I don't claim to be a nuclear engineer. That sounds like a pretty big ask from, uh, that sounds really tricky to do. I mean, the nuclear proliferation on the fission side is obvious. You know, you have a nuclear power plant, you don't know whether they're using it for enrichment and for which purpose. And so it's, it's very hard to differentiate. This is a very different situation here uh, where you'd have to completely re-engineer the way a fusion power plant would work. Um, and in a way that I think would be quite obvious from the outside, but again, yeah, no, I, uh, <laughs> well, I only bring it up because the, the fission people say the same thing. I probably agree in both, in both cases that you'd have to look at the specific circumstances. The problem is the regulatory effort to prove it. Like the regulators make the, you know, the fission community pay, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars just to prove the thing that you and I would say, Hey, this is pretty obvious. Uh, I, I totally agree. And we have a lot of work ahead of us in communication, both to regulatory bodies and to the public. You know, like I said, there's a lot of examples of fantastic technologies about there out there that aren't used or aren't employed only because of public perception, right? Not because they don't work. So, you know, fission comes in that category, you know, Germany, Japan, um, you know, all across this country, California shutting down fission plants. You know, you take out a, a two gigawatt fission plant in California, that's equivalent to like all of their other renewables What's your plan, guys? Like, what what are you going to do about your CO2 problem, California? I know, I know. Japan, you don't have any other resource. What is your plan? Yeah. Uh, Germany, are you just, you're just buying, you're just like, you know, kind of asking China to do it for you, like, you know, just offsetting your carbon issue to other countries. So, um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of all of the above, right? So I, I'm in favor of renewables, solar and wind, and that's part of it. I think fission is still going to be part of it. But you know, fusion is a game changer like no other. I really feel, and this sounds you know lofty and maybe naive, but I feel like it's, you know, once you get to fusion, it's really humanity 2.0 or or 4.0 or whatever they call it, right? I mean, it's really, um, it be everything else becomes optional at that point. You don't necessarily need anything else. It'll still have everything else for a while, but that's really opens up the future in terms of abundant carbon-free, low radioactive um, uh, energy, abundant fuel. Not only that, it helps us, you know, we're not doing a great job as, you know, stewards of this planet. If we want to survive, we may have to get off of it one day. So, you know, fusion allows you to do that. I can't really see a future for your humanity in general, at least if you want to look ahead a few hundred years without having fusion. So, I mean, that's the way I think of it. That's why I'm doing this, um, you know, We'll have a mix of other sources for quite a while to come, but I, I think this has to be the future. Ben love it, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. And initiate at least a new approach to the many difficult problems that must be solved in both private and public conversation. If the world is to take off the inertia imposed by fear and is to make positive progress for peace.